Hey everyone, welcome to the Classy Career Goal Podcast. You are going to love today's guest. If you have ever been overwhelmed trying to grow your business or turn your knowledge into a digital product to sell online, then you are definitely going to relate to today's guest. Christina Scalera is an attorney, a founder behind The Contract Shop, a contract template store for creative entrepreneurs and coaches. And in 2014, Christina found herself dreaming of pursuing a more creative path, like a lot of us do. And she started to look for alternatives to her in-house legal job. And she's going to share with us today what to focus on first when creating your first product online, what to do when you aren't getting any traffic to your website or your shop, the biggest mistakes new entrepreneurs make when selling their products, and how she built a seven-figure Shopify empire by turning her legal services into digitally downloadable contract templates and how you can do the same. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and relax, and get ready to be inspired by today's guest. Welcome, Christina. We are super excited to have you here today. Uh, so share with us a little bit about how your entrepreneurship journey started. Yeah, well, thank you, Anna. It's such a great honor to be here with you. And the way that things got started for me, um, I have a very non-linear journey. So if anybody's out there and they think like they need to just get from A to B to C to D, hopefully hearing about where I came from, where I'm going, like that gives you some, um, confirmation that like, you don't have to take like the path, right? Like you don't have to go from like rags to riches. It can kind of be a little more circular. And what happened was I graduated from school and I got a job working in house and it was my dream job. It was like something I always thought that was like perfect for me. And I was probably around 24 or five at the time decided that this actually wasn't my dream job and I didn't know what I was going to do instead. So I did the thing that maybe some 24 or 25 year olds do. And I went traveling and got a yoga teacher certification. And along the way, I met um, somebody that was teaching private yoga in Washington, DC. And she had a very similar background to me. Um, and what ended up happening is I started my first business, which was carte blanche wellness. <laughs> Very Tell not us a more. thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, very not a thing anymore. Um, I didn't even know the difference between a web designer and a developer. Like I thought they were one thing. And that was um that was really confusing to me. Like the conversations that I had trying to start a website. First of all, I thought I had to have that too. I didn't know that you could just make this on your own. Um, so this is around 2014, 2015. And I, it just like, it was a totally different world back then. So that's where I got started and really got into like the nitty gritty of doing, uh, doing my own graphics. Like Canva didn't even exist then. So I had to like open Photoshop. That's a hilarious story over cocktails mm -hmm. sometime, like, you know, six hours on a plane trying to open Photoshop to like get something done in route to like this conference or something. It, it was hilarious. So anyway, I had to learn all of my own Photoshop. I had to learn all of my own blog. Um, I learned the difference between a web designer and developer. I learned how to update a website without breaking it, which like was a feat back then. And just like all the skills that at the time I was thinking, why, like, why am I doing this? This is not going anywhere. I'm not making any money. I'm just losing money. I'm spending money on all these people that I'm hiring and nothing's happening. Um, and I didn't really understand like what it was all leading up to. And so what ended up happening was I took my background. I took all of these skills that I had learned in the process of becoming my own business owner. And I combined them into what eventually became my online template store called the contract shop. And with that, um, I launched the shop. It had, you know, a welcome sequence and a freebie and that was it. And like a couple of products on presale and it was just total crickets for a few months. And I ended up getting on somebody else's platform, did a webinar to their audience, had never done a webinar before. It was like really basic. So again, you don't need to start out with like tons of bells and whistles. It was just like contracts 101 or something. And within that weekend, we had sold over $3,700 worth of merchandise. That was like the first real money I'd ever made online. And until that moment, I just thought it was like this hoax. So that was January, 2016. 
And with that, I was able to carry that momentum through and really develop the shop into something that it was because at this point I was about $74,000 in credit card debt, consumer credit card debt, um, just trying to like float all these businesses and learn and, you know, wasn't making any money. Um, so I carried that through and that first year I ended up paying off most of that consumer credit card debt and like actually living off of something that I had created, which was a crazy feeling. So I had turned my service into a product with the shop. And then uh, the following year, I rebranded it from my own name to the contract shop. And so that has just really taken on like a life and a flow of its own. It's its own business. And that was how that all got up and running and started. Um, and last year, actually, with the pandemic and everything else that was going on, I just like left the shop for like eight months just did not work at all. And it kept running, kept growing. We grew 39% in that time. And that was a really great period of just, you know, personal growth on the back end that allowed me then to open up the possibility of like, oh, wow, I actually can step away from this. It's still going to run, which like totally was a hit to my ego, but we can talk about that separately. And then, um, it allowed me to start what is now my coaching business where I teach people how to turn their services and their content into digital products that are sold through an online storefront. Yeah. And I'm super excited to dive into more of that too, of the coaching of how to turn your service sure. into a product too. So you did all that through Shopify. So what, like, um, and I love hearing like the beginning, like the first sale, and then you, you grew it, you know, into seven figure Shopify empire. So what was, what were the, some of those steps that, um, after the beginning, you know, that, that helped you scale that? Yeah. So I did start on Squarespace. So my first okay. blog, that wellness blog was like custom WordPress, because I, again, I didn't know that there was a thing that wasn't custom. Um, Anyway, then I went to Squarespace because I was like, okay, I can't break Squarespace. And then in 2017, <laughs> we switched to Shopify, which was the best decision we ever made for the store. I mean, it was like instantly our sales shot up just because it was such a better interface. And um, anybody who uses Shopify, you know, it has like a whole ecosystem. Um, so yeah, that, that was really what it was like along the, the journey and the process. Um, as, as far as like creating those first sales, it was really all about the content. And it was about getting in front of people's audiences who their audience did not, or sorry, they had an audience, but they didn't have the content for that audience on a consistent basis. I think we all know what it's like to struggle with coming up with new content and taking new angles and getting that out there in a way that's impactful and meaningful. And so I just really looked at creating content from the point of view of the person whose audience I was trying to get in front of. And that was, that was like the, the jumping off point. And that's honestly, that's what we still do to this day, like almost six years later. <laughs> I love that. So what mistakes do you see entrepreneurs making when they're trying to turn their, their service? We have a lot of like coaches sure. and, and service consultants listening. So what mistakes do you see them make when they're trying to turn that into a product? they're not listening to their audience. A lot of people start out looking for the container. They say, I want to create a template shop or I want to create eBooks. And that's the wrong question to ask. The right questions to ask are to your audience and asking what, what is it that you struggle with? Like, what is it that you need? Looking at the kinds of things that they're hiring for, the types of coaching, the types of services that they're working with you on and asking how you could help them to get maybe not the same results, obviously that they would get one-on-one -on -one with you, but like, how could you get them pretty far down that path on their own to the point where then they need your group coaching program or they need your services, uh, or, you know, they're working with you in some kind of uh, elevated capacity. And so if you just start with a container, if you start with the, the template and then try to backfill it with the stuff that someone will buy, you're never going to be successful at selling on a consistent automated, like autopilot basis, because there's just not enough demand for the products that you're creating. It's just coming from within you. It's not coming from your audience. And that's the number one reason why any kind of product shop is going to fail is there's just not enough demand. You weren't listening to your audience and creating the things that they were telling you. Um, again, that's not always like verbally telling you that's like showing you watching what they're doing in your store, looking at the blog posts they're consuming looking at what they need and then creating the products around that instead. Yeah. One of the common questions I get is how do you find out? And you, and you started to answer it there too. Like, how do you yeah. find out what they, what they want and what they need? Yeah. You ask them, 
I'm a huge fan of, of asking people both through social, oops, sorry, through social means, um, you know, Instagram and, and polls are great for that. Um, there's a lot of like home goods companies like blankets and like clothing and apparel that do this really well, where they'll have this, they'll have the sliders. So you can make it really fun. You can do, you know, this or that and do comparisons. Those are really fun. But my, my favorite way to do this is with pre-selling getting products into your store that you think will sell, and then only creating the ones that do. People are going to have different opinions with their money versus just taps on Instagram. So that's why pre-selling is by far and away my favorite way to do that, um, which just means you're getting products before they're made, You know, just creating a title, creating a cover image, maybe writing a small description, getting that into your store. And then on the back end of that, all you're going to be doing is promoting that to the audience that you have, even if it's 10 people. And I've had people that have consistently, or I shouldn't say consistently, but they've gotten their stores off the ground with like three or four sales because it became very apparent that whatever they had on pre-sale, like everybody was buying this one thing out of whatever four products that they have. I really encourage people to start with like three or four products. So it's, it's not even like you have to come up with a bunch of ideas to get started. I love that. That's how I sold my first course too, is I pre-sold it. And then I, if no one bought it, you don't have to create it, right? Like you don't put all the effort and the work into actually creating your product or your course if no one buys it yeah, too. So I love, sure. I love that. So tell us, um, you know, how, how do you manage overwhelm in your business, right? There's, there's a lot going on. You mentioned even like with the pandemic last year, you had, you had to leave your, your shop running. Like how do you manage overwhelm when you're growing and scaling this business so quickly? Yeah. And I have ADHD. So I, I hear you on the overwhelm, <laughs> yes. uh, which reminds me, I did not take my medicine. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You need to do Whoops. that when we're done. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, that helps obviously, uh, lifestyle factors are always going to be some kind of uh, contribution to overwhelm. And you'll start to, even if you're like, oh, I'm not overwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed because you know, we're, we're doers. We're especially like women, they're really good at just powering through things and, and maybe denying things a little bit. And I had someone who pointed this out to me and she said, you know, where you start to drop the ball, like you forget to load the dishwasher or, you know, you're just not making your bed anymore. And you used to do that. You're not journaling every morning where you used to do that. Um, you've noticed like you're not taking an evening walk or like just those little tiny things yeah. that are, are falling out of balance. Those are huge red flags that you're falling into a state of overwhelm. And when you're in a state of overwhelm, you're never going to be able to do the things that we're talking about earlier, like listening to your audience and, um, you know, writing your best content or just even showing up for interviews like this in the best way possible, because you're, you're going to be thinking about whatever else is going on in your life or your business. And I know this is super simple, but just coming back to some of those things, um, you know, I have a rule that like my kitchen, I, so I have an Island in my kitchen, it has to be cleared off every single night. And even if like the rest of my house is a disaster that has to be clean. And, you know, like hopefully my desk got clean too, but those are the only two surfaces that I like make myself clean, even if I'm running late on time or overwhelmed or whatever it is. And that, that helps tremendously, um, getting rid of stuff that helps a lot too. But as far as getting rid of overwhelm in your business, I would really look at, you know, where that feeling is coming from. Is it coming from the fact that you feel like you have too much to do? Is it coming from the fact that you feel like you don't know what to do? Like you don't know where to get started. I think that's what hangs a lot of people up and just starting to identify what the source of that is, because, you know, if you actually have too much to do, that's going to be a different solution than someone who just has no idea where to get started. Um, so those are, those are some of the really simple things that actually go a long way as you're trying to overcome that overwhelm. Definitely. Yeah. And kind of on the same topic too, is, is managing your time and, and growing your business. And how do you move the needle in your business, no matter what's going on? And I know that I have a little note to ask you about your hundred dollars a day rule, which I want to know about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I don't know if you want to get into that now, but that that's always been my rule since I started my shop. Um, maybe within the first week of making those, those first sales, I just was like, I, like whatever it takes, I am going to make sure that I'm doing something today that is going to make me a hundred dollars either today or like within the next week, whether that was like outreach, like reaching out to people to get in front of their audience, to do a guest blog post or a JV webinar, 
whether that was blogging on my own site, whether that was creating an email automation, like it just, it had to be a hundred dollar activity every single day that was moving the needle. So that is, and, and now it's, you know, the, the move on the, the, excuse me, the needle moved to $500 and now it's at $2,000. So it can grow with you as you grow your business. But if it's, you know, not a $2,000 task or above, like I'm not working on it, a team member is working on it. I think that honestly, especially with my ADHD, that's helped me tremendously. And I think I hired in a way that is really different than most people. So my first hire was a bookkeeper, which isn't that different, but that was a great hire. And then the second hire I ever made was an ops person. So ops means operations, someone to help me create standard operating procedures, SOPs, and just make sure that things were running in my business. And honestly, that was like the biggest contributing factor to me taking eight months off, like without preparing for it last year is that we had so many SOPs running and someone to pull the strings on that, that I, I could walk away. And even though like I wasn't there constantly creating content, the customer service emails were still getting answered. Um, the products were still being delivered. You know, things were still getting updated on the site. So I would really lean heavily into operations versus marketing if you're getting started, because especially if you tend to be overwhelmed because it's, um, it's, and it's something that, you know, really good coaches will foster and, and help you through too. So it's not like you always have to hire someone who specializes in ops. It could be just someone who understands what this looks like. Yeah. I really like your products that you, you sold too, because they're not things that need your attention. Like I, I obviously have a coaching membership. I have client, you know, I'm, I'm serving them. Um, but I, you're getting my ideas going too, right. Brainstorming, because it's really nice that you, you have all those procedures in place and it's running without you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for coaches, especially it, it would be awesome for you to be able to reach out to someone that may not be able, like they're not ready for your group coaching membership yet, but they could be able, uh, you know, they, they, like a template or something like a sales script. Those are the right. things that could be more accessible to them. And then they, they see what yours is because they're probably buying yours. They're probably buying someone else's They're probably getting some for free. And then if yours really blows them out of the park, you've just created a customer for life. And that's what we're really going for as a shop owner is the customer lifetime value where we have this, anytime you have a shop, there's really a holy like grail of sales, which is like your average order value at the top. We want to get that as high as possible. And then we also want to focus on your conversion rate, just like you would a funnel and then traffic. And so if you can focus on those three things, if you ever have problems with with sales at a, in, in an, um, any kind of online shop, it's going to be with one of those three things. And so the templates and the things that you could sell as coaches are only going to contribute to the average order value, which contributes to the conversions to your other programs. Um, and those people talk, so that helps your traffic. So it really is this nice supporting actor in your business that continues to run no matter what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. So what would you say to someone who wants to create their first product? Like what, what would be those first steps or first things that they should think about? Yeah. Listening to your audience, looking at what you're doing consistently for your clients. It really helps to have clients. If you are trying to create a product, just because yes. you're doing something on a consistent basis with every single person, whether it's your onboarding, or maybe there's like, uh, like an initial kind of planning call that you do with them, that you always go through the same formula. And even though they're not going to be able to get your direct feedback, like they would in a coaching or group coaching type situation, they will be able to get some value out of it. And just the idea is to get them from like B to C and C to D and not necessarily from A to, you know, M or something. Like we don't want to move the needle too far with a product. That's really where your coaching comes in, but your products are just there to give them a really quick, immediate result or I, I say immediate, but like something that takes less than an hour to implement in a way that is even better than they could have created just by going through a course and DIYing the result from there. So for example, with my template shop, someone, I, I mean, I almost created like a contracts one-on-one course. And we, we actually still have a lot of people ask for that. And I always say no, because it took me years to learn the types of things that go into each template. I'm not going to be able to teach you that in a weekend. You're going to be bored out of your mind learning mm -hmm. that. And on top of that, why would I do that when it's going to take you two full days of learning to get you an inferior result when I could just give you a better result in like 10 minutes as you fill this template out. 
So looking for opportunities like that to, to really lean into your expertise and gift that expertise through your products to your customers. And I know this, like if you're more beginner, that, that might feel really hard. And so what you're gonna look for instead is like the kind of content that's catching on. So for example, if you have a blog post that's really, really fire, you're gonna wanna lean into that and figure out how you could turn that into some sort of templated product or other kind of download that someone can use and immediately implement versus like a coaching program that can take weeks. But also again, we're, we're comparing apples to oranges because the product gets them a very small result. And then the coaching program is going to get them a much larger, but longer in time result. Definitely. So what if your, what if your shop isn't generating the revenue that you want? What would, what were, what would be some things that you would do? Yeah. The first thing that we look at is traffic. If you're not getting enough people to look at your shop, like if you're only getting 10 views on your shop a month, that's not enough to know whether your conversion rates are accurate. So we have to get that traffic up, which means getting in front of other people's audiences, uh, possibly paid traffic. If you, and I would only recommend that for someone who's more experienced and has like an, a, like a thriving service business, they're trying to get a passive shop up. Um, but if you're more beginner, definitely looking at getting in front of other audiences, and then the next thing that I would look at if they did have enough traffic to their shop, let's say they're getting, my rule of thumb is like at least 500 page visits a month. If you're getting at least 500 page, page visits a month, we look in Google analytics, it's real people, it's not bots. Then we're going to look at your conversions and we're going to say like, is that conversion rate one to 2%, which sounds really low for people who are doing funnels or coaching or sales calls, because most of you who have sales calls, like your conversion rates are like, you know, 30, 40, 50, maybe 70%. But the thing about an online shop is it's completely hands-off. That means someone just goes onto your website, browses around and makes a purchase without even knowing you. So your conversion rates are naturally going to be much lower. Um, we're just really spoiled with really high conversion rates in funnels and uh, different kinds of marketing mechanisms that we're more traditionally used to in this area. But the thing is with a shop, they're, they're just coming in, seeing a, a landing page, buying anything off of it with a funnel. You have to constantly drive traffic to that in some way with a shop, your content will eventually be doing that for you. Your affiliates will be doing that for you. And so if someone has enough traffic and their conversion rate is not in the one to 2% range or higher, then we're going to look at ways that we can optimize your shop for better functionality. Honestly, the first thing that I ever look at with my clients is, can I add this to my cart and check out? You would be shocked at the number of people who I go on like mobile and I try to add something to my cart and the cart disappears. So they're like, why aren't I making sales? And I show them, I'm like, because I literally can't check out. I know that sounds really simple, but that's one of the first things I check on. And then we go into like more advanced strategies from there. So, you know, is everything loading quickly because people will leave if it's not quick, people are impatient. Um, are you offering any kind of like customer support? Is there like a chat function? Is there a refund policy? Even if your policy is no refunds, do you clearly state that somewhere? These are the types of things that really are going to encourage buyers to have confidence in shopping with you. And a lot of people just overlook them because, you know, they're kind of the last things we think about as we're setting up a course sales page, for example. But these are really the first things you need to have in place in order to create that passive shop. Um, and chat is really nice to just integrate with your email set up an autoresponder. So again, it's not like we're on all the time answering chat. It just happens during business hours and we create that expectation in the, um, the autoresponder. Awesome. And I have one, I have one last question. Cause I know people are thinking this cause this always comes up is pricing. Like we haven't talked yeah. about pricing. So I'm sure people are listening and are like, well, well, if I created a product, like what would I even price it at? <laughs> yeah. So I use an under over strategy that I learned from my She's actually my mindset coach, um, Kelly Newsom George, and she does an over under strategy where she says, okay, well, how would $5 feel? People are like, Oh, I don't like that. Like I put a lot of work into this. Okay. Well, how would $500 feel? Well, that feels too much. Like I would, I would feel uncomfortable charging 500. Okay. Well, what about like $50? That's closer. Okay. Like, but still like feels not great. What about a hundred dollars? Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm just afraid I'm going to have to like really provide a lot of support for that price point. Great. What about $75? Okay. That feels good. And then that's, that's where I like people to start. 
you can slap some vanity pricing, you know, the $73.99 or $79, like whatever it is, you can slap some vanity pricing on it there. And the other way that um, you can price digital products, and again, this is really important because this is the difference between what I've coined as decommerce versus e-commerce. So e-commerce has a cost of goods sold. You have inventory, you have to manage shipping. So this is going to be totally different for them because they actually have like a cost out of pocket. The great thing about digital products is that you don't have that. I mean, there are some overhead expenses, but they're not nearly what you would have with a physical product. Um, so what you can do is you can look at the over under pricing strategy, or you can look at what kind of results the person is getting and say, is my product worth the amount of money that I'm charging to get them that result. So for example, with my templates in, in my, my contract template shop, we charge on average 400 ish dollars, some are higher, some are lower. And the way that that works in the contract shop is when you make a purchase, what you would have paid for a lawyer to review and create and custom create a, a contract for you would have been at least 10 times the price of that contract. So like most custom contracts are anywhere from like 2,500 to $5,000. If you have a lawyer drafted up from scratch and it like that kind of drives me crazy too, because like you're only, it's like a one and done thing. Like our, our templates have been seen by literally tens of thousands of people, not tens of thousands, sorry. Um, about 7,000, 8,000 people at this point. So that's not tens of, I don't want to say anything wrong, but like there's been a lot of changes and updates versus just the one that the lawyer creates for you. So I actually think the template gives you a superior result in that sense. And then on top of it, you're paying a 10th of the price of what you would be paying with a lawyer. And so that's a really good rule of thumb as well as if you can get them a result and then charge them a 10th of the price, it might be a little higher because you know, maybe you're really unique or you have like a very unique value proposition in your industry, but that's a good rule of thumb is like to go for the result and then, um, divide that by 10 and that's your price. Awesome. I love that. Um, so tell us where our audience can go find you online. Yeah, for sure. So everything's at my name, which is christinascalera.com. And you can just kind of half type that into Google. I'm sure you'll find me. That's the benefit of having a hard to say, hard to type name. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, that's where everything is. We have lots of resources for people that are interested in turning their services into products. Awesome. So your final word of wisdom for our listeners who are starting their businesses, creating their products and just ready to grow and scale. What, what would be your last words of wisdom for them? Only follow two people at a time. Like you can follow as many people on Instagram. That's not what I'm talking about, but if you're really going to dive in with a mentor, only have one or two at a time. Because if you're following five different people, one's going to be telling you YouTube is the way to grow. One's going to be telling you affiliates are the way to grow. One's going to be telling you, you just need to do direct marketing or like direct sales. Like everyone's going to have a different opinion and you're going to be trying to do too many things at once, which goes back to that whole overwhelm thing. But if you're only following two people, especially people that are kind of complimentary, it really can help you to move forward. It, it might not feel as fast because you're not going in as many directions, um, but you're actually moving forward much more quickly than you would have if you followed many different people. So really limit yourself. Like if, if you're going <laughs> to, my rule is if you're going to read books, if you're going to follow them on Instagram, like whatever, that's fine. But if you're going to go deeper, if you're going to get on their email list, if you're going to hire them, if you're going to invest in their programs, if you're going to um, just like have them be a mentor in your life, you only get two. So if you want to swap one out, it's kind of like the closet mm -hmm. strategy, right? Like you swap a new piece of clothing out for an old one. You can do that, but only two at a time. And do what they say. <laughs> yeah. And actually go exactly. through and That's finish the, the course and stuff too. I love, I love that advice too. So uh, there's so many people out there. It's, it's easy to get distracted. I know that's something right. I say too, like put the blinders on and focus. So that was yeah. an excellent way to end here. So thank you so much, Christina, for joining us today and giving us all this knowledge. Thank you, Anna.